Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis and a critique of chapter 19 of the book My Daddy is a Hero, How Chris Watts Went from Family Man to Family Killer by Lena Derhali. My God, to hell with the long ass chapters. It was 27 pages on the cloud reader, and those bitches hold a lot of text. Miss Lena seems to have forgotten that not all of us have 12 degrees as she does. I need to be talked down to, damn it. She really wore me the hell out with that last chapter, and with this chapter as well. I have freaking undiagnosed ADD, and I have CRS, can't remember shit, and this chapter was long as hell. So I struggled, man, it's a struggle. Thank you to everyone that's been giving me more names to call Penhead. It helps when I get tired and can't think up of some new shit. It's like giving you a bit of a shout out when I use them. It's a message that only me and you will understand, so please keep them coming. Miss Lena begins the chapter telling us she's a certified Omega Relationship Therapist. She explains that attachment and development in childhood is how we choose our romantic partners as adults. Omega Theory explores unmet needs and frustrations in adult romantic relationships and how it's connected to childhood experiences with our primary caregivers. The way I understand it, it's the people that cared for you the most, from birth and up to around age five. It's not always necessarily with your parents, but invariably this person will somehow wound you. No one is perfect. This does not mean they were abusive. They did something that did not meet your needs or meet what your particular needs were. This has something to do with how you choose your romantic partner, explains Miss Lena, and then they're pretty much going to fail you in this area as well. So I take this to mean a child that's placed in full-time daycare from age six weeks onward. There are various caregivers throughout the years. Miss Lena doesn't say this, but if I'm understanding her theory correctly, it stands to reason. But then again, I don't have 12 degrees, so... But before that, and more importantly, comes attachment theory. Attachment theory was born out of the work of psychiatrist John Bowlby and developmental psychologist Mary Ainsworth, who theorized that there is significant importance placed on the child's relationship with the mother that affects social, emotional, and cognitive development of the child, end quote. It was observed that infants experience intense distress when they are separated from their mothers, and they can tell the difference when being fed by someone else, and they would just flip the hell out. This, Miss Lena says, makes sense because infants have to have an attachment to their mother who provides food and security in order to survive. That just gets me to thinking because my mind always wanders, but I would like to hear Miss Lena's thoughts on infants that are separated from their mother at birth, you know, because they're going to be put up for adoption or say maybe their mother passes away. Sorry about that. Back to the chapter. Bowlby's theory also says everyone is born with a natural desire to form bonds to others in order to survive. I think that answers my question. He says that infants at first have one main attachment person and they rely on them while they experience the world. Ideally, a secure attachment child will have received warmth, nurturing, attention, and comfort from this person. This plays a role for the future as this first relationship will affect all future bonds with others. If you get all fucked up during the most vital time in attaching from birth to five years old, then it will have a major impact on relationships later in life. Quote, as children get older, their need to separate from their caregivers intensifies, but they still need the reassurance that they can come back to a reliable caregiver if need be. This reminds me of a strong-willed toddler, you know, pushing away from mommy and then come running back later when they need help, crying, need their blankie, etc., like Cece would do with Shanann. In Omega Relationship Therapy, no matter how ideal one's childhood is, no one comes out completely unscathed, end quote. Great. Everyone will develop something called early wounding. This is what I was talking about earlier, as I tend to go out of order and shit. 
based on what stands out to me the most because of my ADD. But everyone will develop something called early wounding. It's not reasonable to expect a child to get all of their needs met in childhood. There's just no such thing as a perfect parent, just as there is no child that has all of their needs met. That makes me feel better, knowing that we're all fucked up and do the fucking up in some way to our own children. When a child starts to figure out that a need of theirs is not going to be met, they make adjustments to hinder, hurt, and go into survival mode. Quote, in early childhood, for example, if there is a high-conflict household, a child may learn that if they stay quiet and do as they are told, they can avoid at least some conflict or punishment, end quote. Okay, so this sounds like my childhood home. I didn't know it was called a high-conflict household. I just remember trying to sleep while my mother explained at the top of her lungs that my father was a goddamn bloody sod. He didn't disagree about that. He would just pour himself another drink and then pass out wherever he was sitting. Sorry, back to the book. In adapting to our environment, we learn to shut off parts of ourselves we believe are shameful. We get messages about ourselves that are both overt and subtle. We see messages from everywhere and everyone about who we are, how we should act, and how we need to conform so we fit in. Quote, for example, if we're told we talk too much, we may become reserved in order to hide the part that we're being told is unacceptable and needs to be repressed. Y'all, do you. Don't be all stifled and shit. If the family dynamic is to constantly brush problems under the rug and not address them, then the child learns that problems should never be discussed, and they do not learn how to deal with issues in productive ways, end quote. The subtle and covert messages seem to be more powerful than the clear and direct ones. These messages stick with us, like forever, like that hair you try and get off your hand in the shower that somehow manages to get lodged up under your boob and all over your body as you try to apply lotion. Oh, sorry, that's probably just me. Let me read that last part again because you've probably got distracted like me. The subtle and covert messages seem to be more powerful than the clear and direct ones. These messages stick with us forever. Quote, part of our well-being and successful development relies on the extent in which we could be most like our authentic selves in childhood. End quote. In childhood, Pinhead was reportedly quiet, shy, and socially awkward. Pinhead said his childhood was good, and he seemed to believe his needs were generally met, according to the Wisconsin interview. In this Wisconsin interview with Graham Coder, Tammy Lee, and Dave Baumhover, Fuckface said his mother Cindy was the, quote, more aggressive one in her marriage with his father, Papa Ronnie. He said his sister Jamie was a mother figure to him, and still is. Chris said his mom Cindy told him he was, quote, hard to read when he was a kid. He knew he was different than others, like the way he didn't feel emotions like other people did. Chris admires Papa Ronnie, who would show up at all of his sports games, even when he wasn't playing. And they would do things together all the time, like going to race tracks, and they had a mutual interest of cars. Pinhead's relationship with Papa Ronnie was the real deal, and Lunkhead felt like he could be himself around his daddy. I meant to consistently call him Chris throughout the part of talking about him as a minor. But of course I fucked it up by bad habit of uh, calling him names or just a habit. I don't feel right calling a young child names. So sorry, Chris on all those parts. Quote, from Shanann's perspective, as relayed from her friend in the police discovery documents, and it's unclear whether Chris had explicitly said this to her, it was alleged that Cindy was not a nurturing mother during Chris's childhood and teen years. Also in police discovery, Shanann told her friend that Cindy was possessive and controlling of Chris, and that when they moved to Colorado, he was, quote, so ready to get far away from the negativity they placed in his life. Chris, in his prison confession, stated, quote, I just don't show emotion as other people do, end quote. So, according to Pinhead, when they left North Carolina, Shanann's brother and dad and the whole family was crying. This confused Lunkhead. He said he never saw his parents get like that when he left. Quote, was I born this way, he said, end quote. That's kind of sad, actually. 
Quote, my dad couldn't speak at the sentencing hearing because he was going to lose it. It hit me because I've never seen him like that. No one has ever seen me that way either. I never saw my dad cry, so maybe it imprinted in my brain that I should never cry. Even if something was wrong, I probably would never say anything because I would just deal with it myself. I don't know if growing up that way kept me that way. You deal with things on your own until they build up so much and you can't deal with them. They take a hold of you in a way that you never thought." End quote. Miss Lena says that it's still very common to kind of quietly teach boys to cut themselves off from important emotions. Common and popular messages boys get are, don't cry, crying is weakness, don't show emotion, don't be a pussy. Miss Lena says males are deeply sensitive and these messages promote stuffing down their core needs and feelings. Miss Lena says she often sees men in her psychotherapy practice that are like the way Chris described. They've shut down their emotions for so long that when they finally blow, it shows as extreme anxiety, depression, relationship issues, rage, alcoholism, etc. You name it. Kids of parents who, quote, don't express much emotion and don't allow them to express their feelings can feel as if they can't depend on anyone, and that increases their risk for becoming adults with narcissistic traits, end quote. Miss Lena is like, quote, I do not blame Cindy or Ronnie for Chris's lack of ability to deal with his emotions properly, end quote. I think that's one of those disclaimer things. The source of Cindy's relationships with her family was in Cato's book, God Almighty Son. In the book it says, quote, Cindy and her mother did not get along living just down the street. Her mother tried to control Cindy, tell her how to raise her children. Although his grandmother was extremely negative, that didn't rub off on Christopher, end quote. Hmm. Okay. Miss Lena thinks that from the day Pinhead was born, I mean Chris, he, quote, probably already had emotional vacancies and an inability to authentically connect with others or empathize. However, a brush things under the rug type of household could have contributed to his lack of ability to deal with his relational issues in his marriage with Shanann and the other issues he was suppressing and not dealing with in a mature way, end quote. She said it seems from some of his comments that he was almost jealous of Shanann's relationship with her family, like when her parents were boohooing when she left North Carolina, and he thought, quote, I never saw my parents get like that when I left, end quote. He wanted someone to feel like that about him so he could feel special. Miss Lena says he may have started to resent Shanann for having what he didn't. She references the Daily Mail exclusive, where Cato said that Chris was, quote, mesmerized by Nikki. She showed him respect that he didn't feel like he had ever been shown before, end quote. He just did not see that that shit was not going to last. Both the respect and the relationship. Dumbass, are we really going to believe the Daily Mail article after the whole plagiarism thing? Miss Lena says it appears Penhead had always felt disrespected by the people in his life. Quote, whether or not this was real or perceived by Chris, any feelings of disrespect over the years most likely fueled his anger and entitlement. End quote. When Chris went off to college and Papa Ronnie felt that a cocaine addiction was a good idea to fill in the loss that he felt, Chris was, as usual, aloof and indifferent about it. When you're an empty shell, stuff like that doesn't alarm you. He said, quote, I don't think it affected me. It didn't deep down really hurt as much as I thought it would. It was kind of weird. When my mom and sister tried to talk to him about it, he would change the subject. And when I tried to talk to him about it, he would immediately change the subject. He was just coping with, I never came back home. I never really knew why he was doing it. After the fact, I knew he was coping with that. My mom thought he was having an affair because the money was going somewhere. I tried to talk to him about it. You could see it in his face, what drugs do to your face. His skin was loose, his nose was bleeding all the time. You could see it in his eyes, end quote. This is another instance of how the whole family just pretends shit isn't happening and keeping that stone face they all have. Well, except for Jamie, she always has that frozen smile on her perky and delightful face. 
Miss Lena says Papa Ronnie was, quote, turning to very unhealthy coping mechanisms to deal with his inability to deal with the difficult emotions of losing his son when Chris left the house for college, end quote. She's speaking of Papa Ronnie's new hobby he took on, coke, blow, snow, white, powder, lines, rails, bumps, a naturally occurring stimulant that is one of the most popular of the hard drugs these days. It's highly advisable to stay away from the devil's dandruff. Secrets and failure to communicate just stoked agitation in the family. Cindy figured he was having an affair as she noticed money going missing while he was being all secret squirrel and disappearing and being sneaky jumpy and jittery horse shit. Miss Lena says we just make up shit in our minds when we don't have enough information. This is true. Quote, this example also shows Chris's potential lack of empathy and feelings. He expected to feel hurt, but he didn't because he doesn't seem capable of feeling the depth of what is expected with normal human emotions, end quote. That's because he's not human. He's not civilized or moral or intelligent. He's kind of an unnatural beast-like android. He's a cruel, inhumane, and dehumanized savage brute. She says some of his needs probably weren't met, in part because he wouldn't speak the hell up, or, quote, because he didn't know what they were, or he didn't have the emotional landscape, and the focus on emotional needs may have been placed on the stronger personality types in the family, such as Cindy and Jamie, end quote. Yeah, the squeaky will gets the grease. Only the loudest whiner gets what he wants. It means if you bitch loud enough, you'll eventually get your way. Buckface did what he did best and just faded into the background and went about his business quietly. Since he wasn't all lively and shit, he needed to figure out ways to get people to like him. Chris and shit wasn't all loud and high-spirited like his sister Jamie. He said he never wanted to be like Jamie anyway, so he figured out all by himself that he should just always be a good boy. He wanted to be seen as kind, helpful, and quiet so he could get some compliments, and he wanted to be all admired and shit. Then he grew into a nice guy, not to be confused with the nice guy that is genuinely kind and caring. This is the one who has ulterior motives. He believes that he conducts himself in a certain way and the world owes him for his efforts. He doesn't make clear what he desires and wants from the beginning and then becomes angry when he doesn't get what he wants. A real nice guy who is just nice but without expecting a reward for it. He's not that kind of nice guy. Quote, when Chris remembers the type of child he was, he describes himself as the person who was always trying to coax people down. One fight in third grade was the only trouble he ever had at school. End quote. According to him, quote, I never really talked to many people. People knew who I was. I never spoke to many people. I didn't have a girlfriend in high school. I was under the radar. I didn't want to be part of a group or a clique. I didn't want a whole lot of friends, end quote. Miss Lena says this comment is interesting because it shows Chris is trying to distinguish himself from his sister. She kind of feels like he was tired of her shadow, and he secretly might have craved some of that attention she always got, so he kind of protected himself by telling himself that he didn't want to be like Jamie. So, Pinhead worked hard to be a person everyone liked, respected, and admired. No one in his past had anything rotten to say about him. Quote, the unspeakable acts of violence he inflicted on his family shocked everyone who knew him because of his persona of perfection and goodness, end quote. One of his former teachers said, Oh my God, this is a shock. He was one of the best students I ever had. That was one of the smartest students I ever had. The guy had a photographic memory, end quote. Miss Lena says he's a violent, abusive, and dangerous person. Yes, I agree. Quote, the man who is described as someone who wouldn't hurt a fly plotted the murders of his family and was relentless about following through with his plan. He even said in his letters to Cadle that he felt no remorse for his family. All he felt was that he was free to finally be with Nikki. All he cares about is himself. End quote. Tell it, Miss Lena. Dumbfuck gets off on people thinking highly of him. This is more along the lines of a narcissist because they depend on the approval of others for their self-esteem. They are cold-hearted assholes who are greedy for admiration. 
Miss Lena refers to copycat Cato's book when she said repeatedly that it was very important to Pinhead what people thought of him. He wants to be seen as kind and helpful and shit. It bothers him when people hate him for being a murderer and judge him. Well, I'm sorry it hurts his little non-existent feelings. I thought he already knew that we hate him and call him names. He should let us know when he's able to emotionally process us calling him out on his bullshit. Pinhead liked that he was different from other guys that Shanann dated and that her father was impressed that he jumped in to help with the fixing of Shanann's car. Frank said that every other guy she dated just would have let him do it. Then she talks about where in the prison interview he claimed he couldn't be himself around Shanann and was always nervous around her. Supposedly he could be more himself with Nicolai, even though she wore the pants in that relationship, just as Shanann did. She must have told Penhead that he was being himself, and like, he was like, yeah, but he like, but he waited for her to tell him what he wanted and needed, from counting calories to a protein eating plan to looking for an apartment. Then she talks about when he got all butthurt when Tammy Lee started talking about how he'd sent a text to Cody Roberts the day before the murders saying that he would head out to Survey 319 first thing Monday morning. Tammy said there's a lot of people who said you wouldn't normally do that. And Pinhead got all indignant and shit saying I wouldn't help. Blockhead likes to think of himself as Anna Darko's mythical being wearing a cape that magically appeared and rendered assistance. Quote, Chris seemed more upset to think that someone said he wouldn't be helpful than he did discussing Bella's post-mortem injuries. End quote. Yeah, stupid asshole really has his priorities in order, as always. What a dumb fuck. He really is a fucktard. An uninhabited fuck. Tart. She says Chris relayed to Cadle that he, quote, feels famous. He's very careful. He wants people to think good of him. It's very hard for him to be called a monster or to be called a murderer. He doesn't like that, end quote. Yeah, dude, you're famous. You have your own Wikipedia page. Damn, are y'all still here? It's a long chapter. Please hang with me. I think it'll get better. Then she says, much to my horror, that there are two Chris's. Oh God, perish the thought. Anyway, she says there's two Chris's, the perfect Chris, and then there's the repressed rage Chris. She said Penhead got tired of wearing his mask and doing shit for other people. He had an inner conflict which might be nice guy syndrome named by Dr. Robert Clover. Apparently, these nice guys like Clunkhead neglect their own needs and end up resentful, unhappy, and angry. Well then, they should have stopped being a fucking fake nice guy. They are dishonest, even with themselves, because they stuff down their feelings. They're secretive and manipulative. And they give only to get something in return. Then they turn around and get all enraged and resentful and shit. They're passive-aggressive, like their mother Cindy. I mean, they're passive-aggressive and express their disenchantment and bitterness in indirect ways. Well, this is me being passive-aggressive. Go fuck yourself. Oops guess I'm not so good at the passive-aggressive thing. They're full of rage, and they'll go the fuck off at unexpected and inappropriate times. They tend to be addictive to sexy empanadas and sexual compulsiveness. They don't have boundaries, and they have a hard time saying no. They blame everyone else for their problems, so there's no accountability. Their only goal in life is to be cruel to those who mistakenly loved them. Please, do not look for a nice guy if you're single. Single people are not machines that you put kindness coins in until sex falls out. These nice guys will take advantage of you. There's always an ulterior motive. I'm talking about the fake nice guys, not the real ones. The poor, unsuspecting women or men think they have a real catch, and they are the best thing that ever happened to them. And then, as in this story, the knight in shining armor turned out to be a fucking loser in cheap-ass tinfoil. Dr. Glover feels the nice guy syndrome starts in childhood. It's a coping mechanism as they don't feel it's safe or acceptable for a boy or a man to just be who he is. They seem to think that being who he is must be a bad and or dangerous thing. 
Well, it turned out to be both a bad and dangerous thing, being Chris asked at Watts. Miss Lena says nice guy syndrome was a way for him to feel valued, respected, special, and adored, but also resentful. Pinhead said he couldn't say no to Shanann, couldn't make decisions, and discarded his own needs in order to keep the peace. Well, isn't that classified as a chicken shit? It is in my book. So he just let everything fester inside, and the ticking time bomb finally exploded. He demonstrates unbelievable, inexcusable, indescribable stupidity. Why did he have to act like such a jack-tart, nitwit, moronic fuckwit, crusty, lathered-up arsebacker, spunk trumpet maggot, sickening donkey, spanking hackwack, bow bag, stinky snot, piss stained cabbage, arrogant, expired coupon, crud shingle, wretched, wank stained, cockwomble asshole, shit pal, candy ass, fanny flaps, yellow belly, waza, waza, empanada, suck pot nugget, weasel eye, twat face, ass licking little fuck, good lord, you fucking ass hat, squeaky grocery cart, overdraft bank fee, wank stained, Jizzster toss hot, massively revolting piece of shit. Fuckity bye. I hope you step on a Lego barefoot. Miss Lena says Shanann became a scapegoat. Many on social media have blamed Shanann for her own death. People have insinuated that Shanann drove Chris and shit to this because she was controlling. She says, quote, How does it make sense to excuse a man for killing his family because his wife was dominant? In a world where women and children are physically harmed by men way more than they are by other women, this is another way that validates violence against women and children. End quote. I love Miss Lena. It's not Shanann's fault that he is a pathetic, scared, weak, cowardly, girly man pushover who can't stand up for himself. She didn't sprinkle son of a bitch rotten fucking apple dickhead dust on him when no one was looking. I would call him a worthless sack of shit, but even a sack of shit can be used as fertilizer and serve a purpose. He just desperately needs to go to sleep or be put to sleep. A study by the CDC showed that out of 100,000 women killed in the U.S., over half were killed by an intimate partner and 15% were pregnant. Quote, Chris was cheating on his pregnant wife. He murdered his wife and children, pled guilty to all charges, and yet some people were trying to find a way to blame Shanann for everything that had happened. End quote. She says the Watts family was in denial at first, and it was a strong defense mechanism for them, that it made sense that they would have an incredibly difficult time accepting that their evil monster son did this. It was so unlike anything he would ever do. Their minds seemed to decide that they just could not cope with what son had done. God almighty son, what'd you do? Haul off the bodies or something? When Cindy was allowed to speak at sentencing as the grandmother of the victims, she spent the majority of her time blathering on about, I forgive you son, I love you. Quote, the Watts family will have a long and complicated journey with their grieving process. I do believe that the Watts family, at least on some level, has finally accepted what Chris has done. It must be exceptionally painful to have to live with that, end quote. The author said that when C.W. made his choice to plead guilty, it may have been one of the few times he controlled his own narrative. No wonder Cindy was cross-eyed pissed. She liked making his decisions for him, and she was already fed up with him being married and Shanann taking her place. And even though he's admitted to killing his family in many confessions where he spilled his guts in the hope of divine forgiveness, there's always an excuse. Ranging from demonic possession to if he hadn't met Nikolai, if he hadn't gone to the baseball game with her the night before he killed his family, Miss Lena got that wrong. That was his excuse, but he didn't. He said if he had gone to the football game with Jeremy instead. But back to his excuses, if Shanann and the girls had not gone to North Carolina for five weeks, etc., etc., so everyone and everything is to blame, except for himself, of course. 
Miss Lena said, quote, Spouses should be able to separate physically for periods of time without having to worry about infidelity and murder, end quote. Amen, sister. She said most of these factors probably contributed to the murders, and I agree. But Fuckface made the choice to murder his pregnant wife and his two young daughters in, of his own free will and disposed of them in a horrific manner. She then discusses the image theories that we are subconsciously attracted to our romantic partner because they have the best and worst traits of our primary caregivers who wounded us as children, not necessarily the parents. This is so we can become whole again as we were before we were wounded. That's some heavy shit, man. Thank you, Miss Lena. Miss Lena says we seek a partner with the qualities we don't have or the things we've lost access to during socialization when we learned to bury parts of ourselves that used to be a part of our true authentic selves. Fuckface was subdued, laid back, and introverted. Shanann was vibrant, extroverted, and emotional. When he was all enamored with her and shit, these qualities were attractive to Pinhead. Then it started pissing him off. Turns out, that's kind of typical behavior. He started feeling inadequate with her. Well, he was inadequate. He was insufficient, not enough, deficient, unsuitable, lacking, incompetent, useless, unfit and inferior. Quote, I felt beneath her. She seemed more accomplished than I am and smarter somehow. End quote. So Pinhead was feeling threatened because of his weak ego and sense of self. Shanann wanted him to take control of shit. She was at first attracted to his laid-back style, then got sick of him being a pansy-ass weakling. She was over him not being able to make a damn decision. He let people take over and then got all resentful and angry and shit. Shanann told a friend that CW's childhood lacked nurturing and that he couldn't wait to get away. I think that was true. Him leaving home at 18 as soon as he could, and running off to Colorado with Shanann like his damn pants were on fire. Miss Lena says that CW allowed people to take control of him, but he hated it, but he made it seem as if it were okay and that's what he wanted. In Omega Therapy, it's stressed that your partner isn't trying to piss you off, but they unwittingly stir up some old shit from your childhood. Lena says that CW started with the people-pleasing shit in childhood and loved the approval and the good things people thought of him. Says he may have felt invisible and inferior next to his sister. Quote, all the validation he received by being such a great guy could potentially be his narcissistic supply. Chris learned that being a people pleaser would give him all the affirmation he felt he deserved, end quote. Damn, didn't anybody tell him that pleasing everybody is impossible, but pissing off everyone is easy and more fun? Quote, in his relationship with Shanann, each time Chris felt as if he had to hold himself back or suppress a part of himself, it could have subconsciously triggered the anger that may have been repressed from not acknowledging his needs throughout his lifetime. That was less about Shanann and more about his own issues, end quote. She adds that Shanann was easy to blame and most likely bear the brunt of a lifetime of being pissed off by being controlled. Nikolai respecting him made her all alluring and shit to him. Sex is the ultimate validation for nice guys. Miss Lena says he would have most likely come to resent Nikolai as well. And then we read about what love feels like from a scientific view. What we are doing in the romantic love phase is projecting what we want the other person to be, not necessarily who they really are. MRIs show that when a person is in love, they exhibit activity in the same brain regions that become active when one is addicted to cocaine and other drugs. So, my takeaway from that is, if you are lonely, go snort a couple of lines, bumps, or rails, right? Miss Lena addresses how some found Shanann to be controlling and domineering in Facebook videos. She says Shanann was merely reacting to Chris and the role he was playing with her since the day they met. He's a grown-ass man and capable.
capable of putting his foot down if he felt he was being treated unfairly. If he repressed parts of himself with her, he needed to take charge of that shit and express what wasn't working for him. Shanann figured this was his personality and that he didn't mind her taking the lead. When he flipped the script on her, she didn't know what to do or to think because she only knew one side of him. She had no clue about Creaky. He pursued the shit out of Shanann when they met. She was sick and in a bad place mentally and physically at that time. People with psychopathic traits are particularly good at detecting vulnerability. She told him several times to take a hike, but he wouldn't. He acted all kind and selfless, giving, and just a stack of still baloney, and she couldn't fight it anymore. So what did she do? She gave in. And when he got tired of her, he killed her and their children. But he started the relationship deferring to her and giving her control. He was the one that started the dynamic between them. When she realized he was serious about leaving the marriage, she took a long look at herself and was willing to change things. She knew she had flaws that affected him. All he had to do was talk to her, but nothing mattered anymore. Only Cricky mattered. He claimed in the Wisconsin interview that he never felt belittled by Shanann. Quote, I can't complain. I always knew I was the introvert, and she took control of most situations. We took care of each other for years. It was a good relationship. I mean, it's just like if I never met Nikki, would I have ever thought our relationship was bad? Probably not. End quote. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You ain't nothing but a hoe. You think you're cute. You think you're classy. Newsflash, girl, you're freaking nasty. Quote, although Chris was having an affair and lying and manipulating Shanann, causing her extreme emotional distress, he still had the audacity to blame her for their problems. He never once looked at himself and how he was contributing to the issues in the relationship. Instead of trying to work out his issues for the sake of his children and his family, he used an affair as a way out of his own unhappiness or boredom. Needless to say, these are all extremely selfish, narcissistic and emotionally immature ways of dealing with relational issues. Furthermore, murder is an extremely psychopathic and antisocial way of dealing with problems. End quote. That ends the chapter, and we are 79% of the way through this book, according to my Kindle version. I'm kind of glad because Miss Lena is beating my ass. She may be all petite and shit, but she's knowledgeable and wiry as hell with all of her degrees. I'm actually kind of flattered that she thinks I can understand what she's going on about sometimes. And that will be the end of this portion of the video. Please stay tuned if you would like to see an officer canvassing the neighborhood when they thought that Shanann and the girls were missing. I'll pick up with chapter 20 in the next video. Thank you for listening. Um, people just... uh, we're saying hi, how are you? Um, we were giving an updated uh, Bolo on the missing person. Uh, then we asked them if they know her or know anything about it. Um, or if they have any security cameras in the area. Cameras that might have come. Yeah, and then if they do, then we have them fill out the bottom and we'll take the flyer back. Have him pull forward, Paul. Are you guys with Frederick Police? Yes. Oh. 
we're just handing out flyers on this uh, missing person. Um, okay. If you see them, know them, or if you have cameras on your house that might have seen something, uh, early early hours of Sunday morning is probably the most likely time. Uh, then just go ahead and uh, give us that info and let us know. Okay, at these numbers. Uh, yeah. Well, you can either or, call. You can either call, or you could fill this out right now if you think you have something. I don't. Oh care. no. But no. if not, uh, definitely just give us a call. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Giving, you, Kenny, you doing construction guys too? Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, how long hey. you been working in this area? Uh, we work today. Here. Just today? Yeah. Like uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? Uh, we work Monday. Okay. Uh, anybody? Anybody seen this? This lady or her kids on Monday? Mm, no, I don't no. see her. No, no, no. Nobody's here. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Okay. It's yes, it is. Okay. We're actually just handing out these flyers uh, regarding the missing woman and her children. Oh yes. Out of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have any information, do you know them? No, I just saw them next okay. last night on the news. It, do you have cameras on your house by any chance? I that, don't, that, but our neighbor does. We have inside okay. cameras, but we don't. Okay. We have like motion detectors, but not. Well, if you would just obviously keep an eye out, but yeah, if, definitely. if you. If your neighbors think they may have caught something on video, okay. a vehicle or, or even the family walking or something, sure. uh, just share this information, have them get us in touch, in okay. touch with us. Okay. okay? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Hi. We're handing out flyers regarding the missing woman and her oh. two children out of this neighborhood. That's so sad. Um, did you know them at all? I've never even never seen, seen them. them? No. I okay. lived here, but not for very long. Okay. So. Do you happen to have cameras on your house? Say it again? Do you have cameras, like security cameras or anything, that, house, that might no. have seen something? Mm -mm. No, not in the house. There's not. Okay. All right. Thank well, you. Well, hang on to that. I and will. If, if you I'll come up with any Facebook. ideas, yeah. All right. Bye. Thank you.
20 minutes, it's all yours. <laughs> Hopefully it's gonna, uh, it's not gonna die down. When he's gonna be getting home from work, it's gonna get pick up. Yep. And we're not gonna have enough fire. He's only bringing 100 more, that's what I got. Yeah. Hope it's enough. When they're turning in this way, we gotta let them get to the last guy in line so that if someone's turning behind them, they don't get stuck in traffic. An accident wouldn't look good here. No, but I'm trying to get as much information if they have information as possible. Now just send them to the end of the line this way. How are you doing today, sir? Okay. I'm Officer Davies with the Frederick Police Department. We're handing out yes. flyers regarding the missing woman in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know her at all? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, I just found out she was a couple blocks over. So yeah. yeah. So, do you have cameras on your house by any chance? No, I don't. Okay. Well, if you come across any information, uh, neighbors or someone has seen okay. something, just give us a call and let us know. Right. Please. Thank you. Sure.
How you doing? Cool, We're handing out flyers regarding the missing woman oh, in the yeah, neighborhood. Yeah, I saw it on Facebook. Um, you didn't know her, did you? I don't. Okay. Do you have any information or you have cameras on your house that might have seen something? Yeah, we don't have uh, any cameras. But... Okay. Well, for, feel free to take that, and if any of your friends or anyone knows anything, uh, yes, let sir. us know. We'll do it for sure. My vest jacked up. Yeah. No, you're good. You need one. Huh? I can tell. I've already been walking back and yeah, forth here. Back. If it was jacked up, I'd have looked at. I'd have told you a long time ago. It's the kind of guy. I am. The crew's about to go live. Huh? They're about to go live. Did you hear that, Paul? They're about to go live yeah. right here. So, I don't know. Probably just, they're probably just going to say, this is what they're out here doing, and then they're going to show a shot of us, and then hopefully they're not going to try and Maybe they're going live at the PD. No, no, he said here. They want to go live at 5, she said, and he said here? And she said, yeah. So... How you doing, sir? You been working in the neighborhood? Yeah. Okay, how long you been working in the neighborhood? I don't know, I'm not a little English. Oh. Okay. Have you seen this woman? No? While you're working, you haven't seen her or know anything about this case? Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Guys, you live in the neighborhood? Uh, just with nine news. Oh, never mind. I didn't see your nine there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care of my car, 
There's the outtake reel. Hi ma'am, I'm Officer Davies with Frederick PD. Okay. We're handing out flyers regarding the missing woman. Have okay. you heard about her? I have. Okay. Did you know her? I didn't. Okay. No, I'll sure keep my eyes open. Keep your eyes out. If you have cameras on your house or or you think you may have some information for us, please let us know. Okay. Right. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's wait. They're they're gonna be live on the news at five here. Yeah, this is bad timing. <laughs> Get, huh? Get Kenny out of here.
Hi. How's it going? I'm Officer Davies with Frederick Police Department. Uh, we're handing out flyers about the missing woman. I think, I wonder if you've heard about yeah, her. I've okay. Seen that, yeah. So, if you have any information, uh, you have cameras on your house that might have caught something. Um, please let us know. There's a phone number on there for you. Uh, it should be um, Sunday morning, early hours. Okay. Okay. And if you have any information for us, please let us know. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you already got one? Yes, and I okay. gave him my information. <laughs> Thank so you. I'm taking her home, and then I'll be back in. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. You already been through? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um Everything we've been reporting is Monday morning. I might have misspoke. It's all right. I just want to like make sure I'm like, "Oh my god, Yeah, let me... Because Monday, I thought she got back from Arizona Monday morning at two, around 2 a.m. And then he left for work, so he... So I think it would have been Monday. I might have misspoken. Okay. No, I'm, he'll probably figure it out. I'm going to double check here. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to be telling him the wrong stuff either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I just wanted to double check. Hey, uh, what hours should we be telling these people if they have video footage they're looking Okay, thanks. Bye. Yeah, I was wrong. Monday morning, okay. 1.30 Monday morning <coughs> till... Man is going to check his video cameras. I probably oh, should have said something in that moment. <laughs> Sorry. Let's just not put that one on. No, no, no. no. I, mean, I, 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 I should have said something I, in the moment, but I was like... Uh, well, I, yeah, I was just... Then I was like, this is horrible. No. A Sunday morning, yeah. early hours. Monday morning. Oh God. Sorry. <laughs> what is wrong with my head? Um, yes. Monday. Monday, 1.30 a.m. approximately yes. until afternoon. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Getting them going in and out down here? Yes. Okay. Haven't fun yet? Are you on? Yeah. Having a great time. Happy to be here. I know. Good, better, ugly. I firmly believe in resolution and closure. Well, hopefully they just took off somewhere. A lot of the people coming out are, um, hey, how you doing? Good. I'm Officer Davies with Frederick PD. Are you been working in the neighborhood all week? Yeah. Yeah? Have you seen this woman? I um, don't know. Oh, you don't know who she is no. or anything? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. They're going to go live at 5 o'clock.
Hey, how's it going? Hi. You live in the neighborhood? The what? Do you live here? No. no. No? You're working here? Yeah, I work here. All week? Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Have you seen this woman at all? No. Okay. Go ahead and take that. If you have any information when you're working and you see this woman, let us know, okay? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Good, how you doing? Well, thank you. I'm Officer Davies with Frederick Police Department. Uh, do you live in the neighborhood? My mom does. Your, your mom does? Okay. So I'm sure you've heard about the missing woman. We're handing out flyers. Um, does your mom happen to have cameras on her house? No. Okay. Well, uh, feel free to share that with her. If she has any information, make sure uh, you have her get in touch with us. If you have any information, okay. get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you. When they come in, when they when they're coming in, we want them to go to the furthest officer this direction, yep, yep. so they don't block traffic. And kind of what we had going on down there as well. The traffic coming on in. How are you? I'm Officer Davies with Frederick PD. Have you heard about this missing yeah, woman? Yeah, I have. Okay, we're handing out flyers. We're asking if you know anything, if you've seen anything. Okay. If you have cameras on your house that might have seen anything, let us know. Okay. Um, early hours of uh, Sunday morning until, or sorry, Monday morning okay. until Monday afternoon. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, I don't live here, but my folks do, so I can let them Yeah, let please them know. share that with them. Okay, sounds Thank great. You. Thank you. Live in the neighborhood? I do. Okay. Start up here. I'm Officer Davies with the Frederick Police Department. Have you heard about the missing woman out of the neighborhood? I have. Okay. So we're handing out flyers. We're asking if you have any information. Okay. If you know anything, if you've seen her. Okay. Um, or if you have cameras on your house that might have seen something. Don't have cameras, unfortunately. Okay. So please share. If anything comes up, if you think it's relevant, please okay. let us know. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, 
FYI, Kenny's and I have been working out. If I come across anybody that we want additional information, says, oh, well, I do know him. I'll pass them off to you guys. Then you can get okay. That's fine. more information. That's fine. That's why I was looking over here. Um, go ahead and have flyers again. You got plenty. Oh, I know. Here. Here. I got Here. Give you some of mine. Um, yeah, they were right in my face filming. And I told them Sunday morning. You told them what? Sunday morning. Oh, they blew the and whole the, case. And then she's like, oh my gosh, did you say Sunday morning? That would change everything. And I'm like, uh, 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 did I say? No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, cut that out. Did you tell them that? Yeah, I said, it was Monday. I just got camera stupid. We need Ivan down here. What's that? We need Ivan down here for all the construction workers leaving. He's not he's not on yet. I heard him log on. Okay. Yep. Five o'clock? Yeah, he's probably just taking advantage of the overtime because he likes that. I thought he was coming in at eight. Although I No, he's he's here. Have you already been, have we already talked to you? No. Oh, okay. So we're handing out flyers. Have you heard about this woman that's missing out of the I neighborhood? Did hear her. Okay. Um, did you know her? No, I didn't. Okay. So if you have any information, um, anything comes up that you think might re be relevant, mm -hmm. if you have cameras on your house that might have seen something, um, we urge you to call us and let us know. Okay. okay? Yeah, I've, I've been keeping an eye out yeah. since I heard about it. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. I, I, just them several I did times. that too. <laughs> I did that with the one. All, it was all blue and it just had a little nine news thing on the yep. window. And I, st I stopped them. Yeah. Send them down, Paul. Send them down. Paul, send them down. Hi.
Paul, send him around. Oh, never mind. Okay. Hi. Hi. You live in the neighborhood? Yeah. Have you heard about the missing woman from the neighborhood? Um, I saw this yesterday at my house, but I haven't. Okay. Um, if you have any information uh, that you think might be relevant, please give us a call. If you have cameras on your house that might have seen something, also please let us know, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Makes for dramatic news footage when you're sweating. It does. It really does. You're you ringing? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's my personal. Oh, not your real phone. My parents called on the way in. My dad corrects you. I love you. Be safe every day. Yeah. I, I don't, they're just great. My parents are great. <laughs> I work phone right. Like, I love you too. Hold, please. Would you please come in? My mom. Who oh, are you talking to? You ever watch Seinfeld? Uh, yeah. Like back in the day. Not when, when not Jerry's religiously, on the but, yeah. phone with both of his parents because they speakerphone it. Uh -huh. Look what it's like to talk to my parents. <laughs> so my mom was in the background. What's she talking to? My dad. Shh. She's had a work phone. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I'm surprised. I mean, I printed a hundred more. Coonrod printed a hundred more. And we're, I've got a, you've got quite a bit. Yeah. Is that the white one? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Do you live in the neighborhood? I do. Okay. <laughs> Hang on a second. You live in the neighborhood? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. One second. Have you seen this woman? She's the missing woman. You've probably seen on the news or heard something about it. I haven't. Okay. If you have any information, please let us know. If you have cameras on your house that might have seen anything, please yeah, let us know. Yeah, we do have cameras, so yeah. Okay. I'll take a look. Yeah, Monday morning in the early hours through afternoon. Okay. Thanks. Right. Sorry. Um, yeah. You're aware of the case? Yeah. yeah. Not super, just that she's missing. Okay, so she lives in the neighborhood, yeah. in the neighborhood here, and... Um, if you have any information, maybe you have cameras on your house that might have seen anything, uh, please let us know. Do you happen to have cameras on your house? I don't. Okay. Yeah, I'm not well, if anything comes up that you think is relevant, please let us know. I will. Okay. Thank you. You already got it. Okay. Hi. Hi. You live in the neighborhood? Yeah, we live on um, Wings Creek, right back here. Okay. Are you aware of the missing woman from the neighborhood? No, but we heard about a child that was missing. Okay, so it's a woman and her two children. are bo They're all missing. Oh, dear God. Um, she's pregnant. Oh, my God. And we're trying to figure out if anyone knows anything. So if, if you think of anything that might be relevant, or if you have cameras on your house that might have seen something, give us a call and let us okay, know. Okay, yeah, because they live right up in here. Okay, do you up have cameras on your house? No, we don't. We okay. live back there around the coldest, inside of cul-de-sac, but... Okay. Um, well, if you no, have but, any... You know what, the best thing to do is ask kids. Yeah, if, you, if you come up with any information, yep, let us know. Okay, Thank I you. will. Thank you. Thank you. This is why people drink water. I gotta learn how to do that. Hi. 
How you doing, sir? You live in the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of this missing woman from the neighborhood? Oh, you did? Okay, well, this one's a little different, I think, but um, basically the same thing, I'm sure. Um, if you have any information, videos on your, or uh, cameras on your house that might have seen something, um, any information that you think is relevant, just let us know, okay? Thank you. Ma'am, I assume you live in the neighborhood. Yeah, I, get, I got one. Oh, you, you already got one? Okay. Yeah, we actually live right around the corner. Okay. But, uh, yeah, if, if anything comes up that you think is relevant, yeah. uh, let us know. Uh, okay. It's tough. Yeah, thank you. I'll get you then. Hey. Hello, How you doing? Good. How are you? You live in the neighborhood? Yeah, I got them. Oh, you already got one? <laughs> okay. Yep. We're starting to get people twice now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. That's why we're riding nice right now. We already got her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those sprinklers look like this. So why would you feel sunburn? This this money maker, as Jimmy's Fairbanks saw. puts it. It's called suscreen. No, yuck. Ew, greasy, yuck. That was a horrible hour. That was like the worst hour I've ever had. Right here. Camera in your face? Oh, isn't it awful? I know. <laughs> God! I, oh, the, no, I the worst really part is your instinct is your to hit it. Down. Is it really? You suck. Mm. Like kicking your nuts. <laughs> the worst part is... When on camera, I it's most the, amazing you looked at it. Though. There's a man that says, "We have cameras on our house. What, what hours should I be looking for?" And I said, "Sunday morning, early hours." Yeah. And uh, he drives off, and the reporter lady goes, "Did you say Sunday morning? This changes everything. We've been reporting Monday morning." La, la, la. And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa!" <coughs> Sunday night, Monday morning. I, to the I was wrong. Person. I was wrong. <laughs> like, eat your foot, bread. I don't know. I don't know. I think Talk so. Anyway. Or not. News cameras. Yeah, that's a freaking porch pirate right there. See, all Remember them that See the Amazon packages? What is it? CRN 206. See all those Amazon packages? I'm not as pleased selfie as you. Good job on getting it. What? Maybe there's a repeat now. Yeah. Hmm. Might be time well, to wrap it up. Hmm? What? Hmm. Hmm. What?